chapter 18. I'm going to read for us verse 36. This is what the word of the Lord says. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things according to your word. We have been following the story of the life of prophet Elijah and this evening we come to this time. The time has certainly come for Elijah to confront the prophets of Baal and notice, I want us to notice that in this confrontation, it really wasn't Elijah's idea. Look at the scenario. God has, God extended patience. Here is a bunch of people. His people are called by His name who are involved in steep idolatry under the, under the rule of King Ahab. So God has extended patience to His people when they turn to idols. But yet, when God extended patience, His patience didn't lead them to repentance. He sent them warnings. He sent them droughts, sent them famines. And, and that lasted for good three odd years. But His judgment did not lead them to repentance either. That is a scenario. So think about this. Here in the land of Israel, among God's own people, the Jews, the prophets who spoke the word of God, they were being hunted, they were being persecuted, and they would be killed if they are found. While the followers of Baalism, of Baal, those who are involved in steep idolatry, where they are being sponsored, fed by the royal family from the national budget, that is a scenario. Then one day, finally, right, God sent Elijah to Ahab and he said to him, Send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who ate at Jezebel's table. So think about it. Just think about the situation during that time. Picture the scene. Nearly 1,000 prophets are dressed in bright colors ready to perform when they are finally gathered. They are all ready to perform whatever religious rites that is, that is called for. And imagine that a large crowd of people, all the Jews, would have gathered from the ends of the country right, for this big showdown between the prophets of Baal and Asherah and the one prophet, Elijah. So on the other side, stand one lone person the lone prophet who speaks, who acts under the direction of God. So this is what we are looking at, looking at in this story for this evening. And in this part of this story, I want to make for us four observations this evening. The first one we'll take a look at is we'll consider the challenge, the challenge to the prophets, right? The challenge issued by Elijah to the prophets. Verse 21 tells us, And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If God is God, follow Him. But if Baal is God, then follow Him. That is a challenge of Elijah, right? To the, to the people of God. And in this challenge of Elijah to the, the people of God, I want us to first note that there is a decision to be made. There's a decision to make. They are limping between two different opinions. Now, this speaks to us very powerfully, right? To us today, if during that time, if we had taken a survey among all the Jews, right, that are watching this whole big show now, I tell you, the vast majority of the people there will say they believe in Jehovah God. They will say they believe in God, the God of their fathers, except that over their years, the past many years, because of the influence of Baalism, because of what is being advocated by the king, their walk with God has become hopelessly compromised. That was their problem a compromised faith, and that's the significance of the word limp. How long will you go limping between two opinions? Now, let me ask you, let me do a survey, not asking you whether you believe in God. 
How many of you have heard of the name James Monroe? Put up your hands. James Monroe. None. How many of you have heard the name Marilyn Monroe? Put up your hands. Right? The difference is quite telling, isn't it? Well, James Monroe was the fifth president of the United States. And he was actually well known for what has become known as the Monroe Doctrine. Right? And this doctrine talks about his firm conviction that America should not become involved in any wars in Europe. That has been known as the Monroe Doctrine. But yet, today when you talk about the Monroe Doctrine, nobody thinks about James Monroe. Who did they think about? Marilyn Monroe. Because the name in recent times have become associated with her, this famous actress whose life and death has been marked with great sadness. On one occasion, she was asked if she believed in God. And that's her answer. I believe in everything. A little bit. I believe everything. Tampo, tampo. Was her reply. And it was Philip Riken, an American theologian who described this as a new Monroe doctrine, believing in everything. Tampo, tampo. Just a little bit. And it's what he says. The basic principle of our world's culture, right? It's what it is right now. People do not want to be intolerant, so they believe a little bit in everything. The majority of people believe in God. A lot of people believe in the Bible, in Jesus, the power of positive thinking. They also believe in the basic goodness of humanity. They also believe in good luck, in alien life forms, and checking horoscopes every day. Right? The only way to believe all these things at the same time is really to adhere to this new Monroe Doctrine, which is to believe everything a little bit. And this is precisely what Elijah's challenge to God's people was all about. How long are you going to go limping right, between two sides? So, brothers and sisters, we cannot worship God and at the same time, at the same time, we craft out our own sense of morality for our own life, our own purpose. As long as we try to do both, we will be limping along and there is a decision to make. So that's the first thing about Elijah's challenge. The second thing first to note is that there is a reason to grasp. Verse 21 of chapter 18, verse King tells us, If the Lord is God, follow Him. Elijah did not tell us. I want us to notice. Your parents, he doesn't say your parents followed the Lord. You should also. Your husband followed the Lord. You should also. Your best friend followed the Lord. You should also. So if your parents follow the Lord, you should. Sounds like a powerful argument. But it's quite manipulative, isn't it? Because nobody has a right to tell us to believe what our parents believe. Each of us have that choice. Each of us must make that choice in a sense. So following Jesus because our parents do or because our spouse do or because our friends do will not stand the test of time. It will not stand. When challenges come, when you're faced with, with real big issues, our spouse who is in the faith will stand when we will not. So Elijah doesn't say, follow the Lord because it's the right thing to do. So he doesn't appeal to our moral duty. You don't follow Jesus because that's the right thing to do. So our business is not to try and impose some Christian morality on some godless people. In fact, someone I, I sometimes hear people say, even if Jesus is not resurrected, even if he's not raised from the dead, I think among all the religions, the Christian faith, the Christian life seems like the best. Lah. Right? Seems to be good in a sense. But that's not what Paul says. What did Paul say? If Christ is not raised, we are the most miserable people in the whole wide world. That would be the way my granddaughter would say it. The, the most 
the most what the most miserable people in the whole wide world. So if Christ is not raised, the church has got nothing to offer to anyone. So our message is simple. We live in a God where He has risen. Right? Life, our life, our purpose, our enjoyment of forgiveness and joy can be found in Him. So if the Lord is God, follow Him. So the challenge, the challenge is not to follow the way of life that is right for us. The question, the central question is, who is God in New Testament terms? What do we think? What do we really think of Jesus Christ? What is our real conclusion about Him? Is He really God? Do I really, really believe that He is God? Right? And what should be our response to Him? That will determine our position before Him. The third thing about Elijah's challenge, there is an urgency for us to consider. How long? How long? Years have passed. These people who have knew about the Lord had not come to a conclusion. My question is, how about us? How about us? Have we really concluded that Jesus is Lord or Jesus is a God? I know about Him. Is He my Lord? So here we are in church. Many years. Where are we? In terms of our conclusion about Him. So here we are, we have been taught about God. And we do have some kind of faith, right? We do have some belief in God. But it's not clean cut, you see. It's not clear cut. We are limping. In some measure, we are attempting to embrace God, to embrace Christ, and we are embracing the world at the same time. And as long as we are limping, we will not be making much progress. Some of us are still limping. question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to throw ourselves into sin? Are we going to throw ourselves into being a servant of God? We haven't made up our mind. And when we are in that kind of posture, not ready to give off all things, put behind our life of sin, to walk a true life of holiness and repentance and in the fear of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we are like that. We are limping. We have a foot in both camps. We have a foot in two boats, so to speak. So some of us are trying to love Christ and we are also loving the world at the same time. We are still toying with the same sins over and over again, never giving ourselves to them completely, yet at the same time, never giving ourselves to the Lord completely too. So how long are we going to go limping between two opinions? The last thing to note about the challenge given by Elijah is that there is an outcome to pursue. If the Lord is gone, follow Him. So the Christian faith can never remain a conviction in the mind. Some of us believe God in the mind. It has never gone onto our heart where the gospel of Christ has transformed us on the inside. The gospel never allows us to limp along Jesus Christ as our Savior, but not surrendering to Him as Lord and Master. There is no middle ground. That's impossible. So there's an outcome to pursue. If the Lord is gone, you follow Him. So first, there's the challenge issued by Elijah. Second, second thing I want to consider this evening, an observation, let's take a look at the prophets. All right, look at the prophets. And when you look at the prophets, we can really observe the sounds of silence. First, there is an early confidence. Right? First 26 tells us, they took the bull that was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning till noon, saying, O Baal, 
answerers. So the efforts of these prophets must have been quite impressive, actually. If you try to imagine the scene, try picturing, picturing them. 450 prophets calling out in prayer. They were beating the drums. The prophets were in some kind of formation or whatever. They were circling around the, the bull. They were dancing and they were singing. Right? And, they, and, we, and we find all the, the trappings of really major religious rituals. I believe that the history, the history channel would have loved, would have loved this, this episode, so to speak. I like to think that the National Geographic magazine would have run a photo feature on this religious dance of these four, five, 400 prophets. It would have been an impressive prayer meeting. Hundreds of people actively shouting, praying for hours and for hours. Think about that. It's very striking that when Elijah asked these prophets to call on Baal to send fire, they accepted the challenge. They must have felt that he has a chance. If fire comes, wow, what's the wrong now? I win in that sense. That's what they were thinking. They must, Satan is able to do false signs and wonders and these prophets feel that their gods can deliver. They were supremely confident in a sense. But with all of these prophets, <coughs> with all their confidence, it's natural for the crowd to look at them and say, can all these people really be wrong? A lot of frantic activities. After all, right? So there was this early confidence. After this early confidence, then we begin to see a growing distress. Verse 28 tells us, they cried aloud and they cut themselves after their custom with swords, with lances, until the blood gushed out of them. What started so confidently, what started so optimistically, so bright, so colourful, suddenly began to turn dark. There is, there, is, there is a more sinister element beginning to show. They began to cut themselves. And at this point, it must be really painful to watch. Literally. So here these men were willing to go through a lot of self-inflicted agony before they finally say, I lose. Before they concede defeat in a sense. And Elijah does not shortcut this process. See, before they can be convinced that the Lord is God, they must be able to see that there is no other. And here's a tragedy. When they called to Baal, there really was no one there. There was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. And brothers and sisters, that is the problem with every spirituality that replaces God at the center of the universe with something else. It leaves us with one dark hole. So here's a question for every person who is not yet a believer today. Maybe you live for sports. Maybe you live for the family. Maybe you live for your career. Maybe you live for the good you can do in this world of ours. But can what you live for Answer your prayers. It's a question to us. Philip Ryken says again, some people worship success, selling their souls to climb the corporate ladder. But there is one thing a career cannot do, it cannot answer prayer. Yet, some people worship pleasure, pampering themselves with rich foods, exciting sporting events, and the latest music. They live with as much luxury as they can afford and as much sensuality as they can get away with. But there is one thing that food and concerts and travel and pornography cannot do. They cannot answer prayers. Well, some people worship personal beauty, giving priority, major, major attention to their outward appearance. As churches empty, health clubs flourish. But there's one thing that cos cosmetic and fitness cannot accomplish. They cannot answer 
prayer. So as we think about what is at the center of our world, can what we live for answer our prayers? Is what all of us must consider. We don't want to find ourselves crying out to an emptiness, a black hole, because there is no one there. So first, there was an early confidence. Then, it leads to a growing distress. Of course, finally, it leads to ultimate disaster. Here, Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. I want to understand that Elijah was in a very different position from ours today. He was a prophet of the Almighty God, which meant that he acted under direct revelation from God. So the special role that God has given to prophets of old explains why right, the fate of the false prophets can be so severe. So a prophet who speaks the word of God Deuteronomy tells us and make it very clear that if any Israelite presume to speak in the name of God, they would do so on the penalty of death, so to speak. So I've mentioned that Elijah is often a type of Christ. He points us to something that the Messiah, the Christ, would do when he comes. So we have noticed that he brings the promise of God to a widow, and calls her to make a great sacrifice. We have seen how he raises the widow's son, pointing to the day of our resurrection. But here in this story, Elijah points us to the great day of God's judgment. The awful end of the 850 prophets who led the people of God astray reminds us of what Jesus said. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. This points us clearly that there is a day of judgment that is coming. What a warning to the person who teaches falsely to the people of God. There is a broad road that leads to destruction and it is marked by early confidence. It will lead to growing distress, but it will definitely end in ultimate disaster. So we have seen the challenge issue by Elijah. We have also seen, right, the prophets, how they acted, the sound of silence. I want to next to consider looking at Elijah. Because in this story, there is really some contrast that I thought is very interesting and good for us to take note. Right? There's a study in contrast in this whole story. First of all, there is a contrast right, in terms of the power of God in the place of the force of numbers. The balance of the power of God represented by one person in Elijah versus the, the, the force of numbers. Here, Elijah, we were told in verse 30, he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. So the altar of the Lord has been broken, torn down for, for, for how long? We really don't know. So try picturing this one man stepping forward, opposed, maybe jerked by many, and here he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been broken down. We are not told that anyone helped him. It is most likely that all of them were just watching what he was doing. So specifically, we were told in, the, in verse 31 that he took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, the 10 tribes of the northern kingdom that separated from the line of David, eh, to whom God promised of a redeemer was given. So it's significant that he took 12 stones embracing the whole of the nation of Israel. Then he pours all of this water over the altar and over the sacrifice. Have you ever wondered, they have got three years of drought. Where did this water come from? Never thought about it, right? No magical answer. It is pro they probably took it from the Mediterranean Sea because it's next to it. So, But you haven't thought about that, isn't it? So here, Elijah seemed alone 
right? Perhaps that's why in verse 22, he thinks that he is alone. He says, I, even I am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450. He felt that he was doing this confrontation all by himself. But there are 450 prophets of Baal. But Baal is a zero. So 400, 400 times zero is what? Still zero. But here, Elijah is one man in God. And one man with God is more powerful than all who would stand against him. So if God is for us, that's what the Bible tells us, if God is for us, who can be against us? So first, there is that contrast between the power of God in the place of the force of numbers, one against 850, so to speak. Secondly, I want to see the contrast where there is a confident faith, a contrast between confident faith in place of relentless activity. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, answer me, O Lord, answer me, that these people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. So after all the frenzied activities of the prophets of Baal, consider what, how Elijah prayed. His prayer is very short. Eh? You read that sentence, less than one minute, you have, he has prayed that prayer, isn't it? They prayed for hours. Elijah's prayer took less than a minute. But Elijah knows exactly who he is praying to. That's where his faith lies. That's where his confidence is in. And that must be our same focus in a sense, right? He knows that he is, he is praying to the God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Israel, the God of the Old Testament Scriptures, right? The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, not God as we would like Him to be or make Him to be, but the God who reveals Himself as the Great I Am. Then he asks, then he asks, what he asks for is plain and straightforward. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that these people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. I wonder how many of us respond in our challenges in the same way as Elijah. Or how many of us respond to our challenges pretty much like the prophets of Baal. Many a times, Wow, kiasu, kiasi, wow, must do this, must do that. You do, wow, you, are, you have to act, you must act, put things into place, put into place. What are you doing? You are trying to answer your own prayer. We feel a lot of our, 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 our response usually been a lot of activities. Stillness, frighteners. Have you not noticed that the Bible does say, be still, be still and know that I am God. Have you not noticed that many a times the Bible tells us those who wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. None of us like to wait. Wow, must do, must do, must do, must do. Solve this problem, solve that problem. Who is answering our prayers? Many a times you are trying to make things work on our own. There are times that God asks us to do something. But oftentimes the Lord is telling us, be still. And know that I am God. I love Exodus 14, 14. Right? You need only to be still. The Lord will fight your battles for you. If God were to tell you that, would you be at rest? What mean so? And then hosi. Quiet, only everything works. See, our fleshy self tells us if there's no activity, nothing will happen. Think about that for a while. Think about it. We look at creating, oh, I must churn out my faith, churn out my faith. It's not something, oh, king, king, then my faith go from three to four to five. It is not. It's just coming into the presence of God and say, Lord, you are God. You are God. That's why Jesus said to all the Pharisees, pagans, uh, no, he told the disciples, pagans think that they will be hurt because of their many words. But then he says, but when you pray, right? Pray like this. 
the Lord's prayer is so short, but the confidence, the confidence in the God is really there. You can't find a simpler prayer than that. So all the self-beating, all the self-punishment, the inflicting of, their, on, on, of all the agonies on themselves, right? of all the Baal, the prophets of Baal, what a relief it is actually to see that here is a godly man who has put his trust in God. So would our Christian life be marked by an evangelical Baal religion? <laughs> or are we confident and at rest that the God that I look up to is a God who, who created the world. He who keeps the world can be trusted to keep me. Do we have such faith? Next, I want to see another contrast. The contrast of answered prayer in a place of silence. So you read, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licking up the waters that was in the trench. So just imagine the intensity of the fire that not only burned up the wood and the sacrifice, but, it, but even burns up the stones and the dust. Believe me, it is not a small fire. It is major fire from heaven in a sense. So imagine then, right? But think about this truth. As you read this part once again, think about this truth. The fact that the fire of God fell on the sacrifice, but not on the people. Think about that. Who deserved to die? Of course, you are the Jewish people. They have been into Baalism for years. They have strayed away from God, walked away from Him. So if punishment, if judgment is to come, who deserves to die? Right? It's of course a sinful people. But yet, this should always remind us of Calvary, where the judgment of God, where it was poured out on another hill, the hill of Calvary, the judgment of God does not fall on the soldiers who nailed Him and crucified Him, nor did the judgment of God fall on the crowds who mocked Him and laughed at Him. But the judgment of God fell on Jesus Himself, who became the sacrifice for us, so that you and I may be saved. That is the beauty of the grace, the kindness, and the rich, rich mercy of the Lord. But I want us to consider lastly the response of the people. Verse 39 of chapter 18, verse King tells us, And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Now I want us to think about a someone, right? Someone that we know that we would like to see come to know Christ. Think of someone who is an unbeliever that we would like very much to come to know Christ. So if we would either call down fire from heaven, would that make him come to the Lord? Or would we, or if you would share the gospel of Jesus with this person, if you have a choice between calling all fire from heaven, working out a miracle, and sharing the gospel of Jesus with this person, and you want this person to come to know the Lord, which one would you choose? Think about that for a while. You know, the natural response for many of us, if I could call fire from heaven, this person will see the fire of heaven. Wow, sure one. Sure accept Christ one. Would that not be true? The natural part of us will choose that. Right? You will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that He is a God of the heavens. He sent fire from heaven, so to speak. Nothing is more powerful than a miraculous answer to prayer, right? Most of us think so. But in this story, it tells us not so fastly. My Anakin, right? See, well, the people of God fell on their faces and they cry out, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. That's chapter 18. That's not the end of the story. 
Go to chapter 19. The very next chapter, the very next chapter, we are going to find that Elijah is saying, even I, only I am left. Indicating that what happened in chapter 18, seeing the fire at Mount Carmel, did not lead the people to lasting change in their life. I want us to notice that. It is not the miracles that will change a person's life. Matthew Henry has this to say, some, we hope, had their hearts turned back. But the most of them, generally, or ge the generality of them, for most of them, they were convinced. But they were not converted. I think this is a very, very important truth. Many people look for signs. And you think the signs are the ones that will bring conversion. They were not. They were convinced. At best, they are convinced, but they may not be converted. Why? Nobody is saved by miraculous signs. How many people over the years have I met when they are in deep, deep trouble? They pray to the Lord, Lord, if you save me, deep bankruptcy, Lord, if you save me, restore my fortune, I will believe in you. Well, their, their prayers were answered by God. They were saved from bankruptcy, make tons of money. But yet today, they are not walking with God. So miraculous signs, good. Lah, huh? It's good to be saved from bankruptcy, isn't it? But miraculous signs will not save a person. An amazing answer to prayer may convince a person that God exists but you will not incline their heart to come to Him. Which is why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.23, some people are looking for miraculous signs, but we preach Christ crucified. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ and Him crucified can change a person's life. A person's life. It's only when we can see how a king of glory, the God of the universe, would be willing to leave his glory to come on this earth in our place to die the death of a sinful man. Only when they catch that glimpse of what that really means, then our life will be truly, truly changed and transformed. We constantly underestimate the power of the gospel to change human hearts. So three years of judgment on the whole nation did not really change the heart of the people. The miraculous demonstration of God's power, awesome power in the fire that, is, that was sent from heaven did not change their hearts either. So brothers and sisters, the human heart is not changed by fearful judgment. It didn't work. The human heart is not changed by miraculous display of power. It didn't work. The human heart can only be changed when we understand the redeeming love of God poured out for us through the dying and the raising of the Lord Jesus Christ applied to our hearts. When you realize that on my own, I deserve eternal separation, eternal death. If I'm burned in hell for eternity, I fully deserve it. When we believe that and here am I, a door open, for, open up for us, a door open up where I'm the penalty for my sin is received by the God of the universe. When we know that we totally don't deserve one tiny, tiny bit, then when we respond to what the Lord Jesus has done for us, that response will be different. So what brings people to God? The passage of time will not do it. Judgment, power on the nation will not do it. Miraculous signs and wonders will not do it. Paul sums it best, one of my favourite verses in the Bible, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is a power of, of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. That is the gospel. What is the gospel in simplicity? It is Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. And when he died on the third day, he rose again in triumphant power. He gave His life for sinners. 
And here he is reaching out to you and I today. He is always ready to forgive. That's what the gospel offers. Not only that, his Holy Spirit is able to give us a new mind, implant new desires in our heart, give us a new life. We can be more and more, right? We can be more than a person who believes in God. We can have the life of God living in us. That is the difference. And that the life is offered to us by Jesus Christ today until that day that we'll be with Him back in heaven forever. So the gospel brings us to a point of decision. Jesus Christ is Lord and He bids us to come and follow Him. He invites us to receive Him into our life as our Lord, as our Master. He is asking us to receive His life so that He, he becomes our Saviour. Not only our Saviour, He becomes a friend who walks with us through all things in life. So don't walk, don't limp between two opinions. How long, how long are we to go limping between two opinions? If God is God, follow Him. If you think Baal is God, go ahead and follow Him. Right? Why waste time on a Saturday evening coming to church when you don't believe in God for who He is? But if God is gone, then let us learn to surrender our life to Him. We may ask, so what does this mean for us? What is it going to cost for each of us? I really don't know how the Lord will challenge us. But someone said this, C.T. Start said this, if Jesus Christ be God or is God and died for me, then no sacrifice would be too great for me to make for Him. That's the call of the Lord for us, all of us, you and I, each one of us, to ask ourselves, are we limping between two opinions? Are we having a foot on two boats? And we are asked to make a decision. Let us be wise and make the right decision. Father, we come before you this evening where many a times we don't realize we don't realize that Lord, your challenge to us is not just to believe in you as God, because Satan believes you are God too. But Lord, your challenge for us is that we may come to a point where we realize that you must be Lord, you must be Master. So Father, tonight we ask for your Holy Spirit to continue to work in our lives, to continue to bring us to be confronted by the gospel, to continue to bring us to the cross on which the King of glory gave his life for us. Open our eyes to see, open our hearts to perceive, open our spirit to experience what it really means, Lord, to give of ourselves fully unto you. So that, Lord, our hearts, our lives, and our future is fully, fully anchored because our faith is anchored in you. So Lord, continue to move in our hearts because you are a God who is patient, kind, gracious, and merciful. But I pray, Father, that we will be awakened. For Lord, there is a decision to be made. There is an urgency for us to consider. So we thank you for your precious word. We bless you. We pray all this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.